From Car Rigs and Ingram, this is It Figures, the CRI podcast, an accounting, advisory, and industry focused podcast for business and organization leaders, entrepreneurs, and anyone who is looking to go beyond the status quo. Thank you for tuning in to the It Figures podcast. Uh, my name is Hillary Collier, and I'm an audit partner in the Atlanta office of CRI. I'm joined today by Doug Mims, who's one of the CRI's financial institution industry line leaders. He's also based in Atlanta. Welcome, Doug. Thanks, Hillary. It's good to be here. So the topic for discussion today is out with the TDRs and in with loan modifications. Well, that's right, Hillary. Uh, the we we got rid of TDR accounting uh, essentially uh, coming out of the Cecil process. Uh, of course, the, the Cecil process from exposure draft to, to final issu- issuance and implementation was a long process with a lot of feedback. In the post-implementation process, there was a lot of feedback about troubled debt restructurings, about the concept, the accounting. And so uh, as a consequence, uh, audit accounting standards update uh, 2022-02 was issued. And it addressed uh, trouble debt restructurings and vintage disclosures. But essentially, it and and all the headlines said it eliminated TDR recognition and accounting. So what have you been seeing in the community banking industry and your clients? Well, I think at this point, and and this is from, you know, just talking to my peers and and talking to clients and and we're actually going out and doing some some audit work and things We're, we're it's kind of been a bit of a slow roll for com- community banks, I would say. What, what we're seeing, uh, first of all, for for the Q1, so, so TDRs w- w- were disclosed as part of the call reporting process. And that process, the instructions for the call report didn't get updated for the first quarter. I, I actually didn't look to see if they're updated for the second quarter. But that kind of drives some smaller community banks thought process around TDRs, plus In what is still uh, a good economy, there's not a lot of modifications being done at a lot of bank at a lot of the banks that we work with, which is generally banks under five billion. So um, it it hadn't come on the radar for some folks. So it had it hadn't come up. And I do think there's some folks that really read the headline that said no more TDR accounting because of Cecil, and they're thinking somehow Cecil's taking care of of the accounting or whatever, and it's it's not happening. So I think you basically have it's it's not really on the radar and it's either people don't know what they need to be doing or it's or it's business business as usual they do know but they hadn't had any modifications so if it's no longer a business as usual what is the scope of uh, loan modifications in the context of the updated standard well i think the the, the first thing that uh, that community banks need need to be doing and, and the first the first question is you know do you have a modification and right. so the, the criteria are um, you know do you have a borrower I guess I kind of got that out of out of order but do you have a borrower that's experiencing financial difficulty and do you have a modification but it's not just any modification it would be there's really four things that fall under under this standard it's uh, principal forgiveness interest rate reduction, other than insignificant payment delay and term extension. So a modification that falls under this standard and the disclosure requirements would need to be one of those four things. So things like um, adding a, a adding or removing a guarantor, um, adding or removing collateral, those types of things, th- those aren't the modifications. Those are changes in the structure of the, of the debt. But the four things... Uh, that, that I mentioned or what, what need to be on the radar. And, and also um, you could have one of those four, but the borrower needs to be experiencing financial difficulty as defined by the standard as well. Well, since that, you know, the definition of financial difficulty can be subjective, um, how is it defined by the update? Well, so the guidance on on that is is has not changed. Gap has not changed in that regard, and so similar concept that there are the, the standard really gives you four things to consider as, and they're not the only things that you could consider, but they're they're the four drivers. And one would be is the borrower in default? 
uh, is the borrower in bankruptcy? Uh, it, there, if there is substantial adapt, doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, that would mm-hmm. also represent potential financial difficulty. And then if, if you didn't do the modification, now the, the fourth tier, I guess, would be if you didn't do the modification, could that borrower go out in the marketplace and get similar financing um, given their credit risk uh, profile? Could they get similar financing, similar interest rate, uh, d- you know, duration uh, from another institution? Well, it's good that uh, there's at least one thing that hasn't changed uh, with this update. Um, all right, so another key subjective element is the other than insignificant payment delays. Um, how has this been addressed in the update? Well, that that's again no change uh, f- from there. So it ought to be it ought to be uh, something that that resonates with community <laughs> banks. Um, the uh, so the an insignificant delay really has I guess four four or five pieces to this. So. Um, if the amount of the restructured payments that's subject to the delay is insignificant relative to the unpaid unpaid balance or collateral value, uh, that's considered uh, that would be insignificant. So, mm-hmm. so if the restructured payment, I'll say that again, because if the restructured payment subject to the delay is insignificant related to the balance or the collateral, then that would be an indicator that it is insignificant. As it relates to timing, uh, the, 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 the delay in timing of the restructured payment would be considered insignificant if um, relative, if it was insignificant relative to the frequency of the payment due, the loan's original contractual maturity date, or the loan's original expected duration. So. Uh, if, if that restructured payment is insignificant relative to those three things, then it would be it would be considered insignificant. Now, there's another component. If you had the standard also requires so if you had a, a borrower that you made a modification for and let's say that modification was considered to be insignificant. It was out of scope because it was insignificant. But in the same 12 month window in the same reporting period, not necessarily just 12 months, but in a 12 month reporting period, if you had another modification, then you would have to assess the cumulative impact of those modifications in determining significance of the delay. So that's a little bit of a twist on that. If you had multiple deals, but it's really about, you know, the, 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 the restructured payment as it relates to the balance and the collateral, and then the delay itself, you know, how much does it deviate from what was the original, um, you know, what was the original agreement? So it, it seems pretty straightforward. And there's not, you know, there's changes, but at least some of the subjective um, areas are, are, you know, remain unchanged. But what are your biggest concerns with the uh, with the update? I think the biggest challenge is is going to be the disclosures because ultimately this, this what we're talking about now is about disclosure. It's actually mm-hmm. not about accounting, right? So right. Uh, the, the disclosures will be challenging. They have changed um, for and and so I kind of from a high level um, for each balance sheet presented, you have to disclose the amount of additional funds committed to a borrower for which you have made a modification. That's in the scope. So if you made a modification that's within the scope of this disclosure requirement and um, so and you've committed additional funds, then you have to you have to disclose that as part of the the process. The second disclosure requirements are related to the income statement. So for every income statement presented, you have to present certain quantitative and qualitative information about the modifications that meet the requirements. So again, if it's if it doesn't meet the requirements we've been talking about, it wouldn't be in the scope of the disclosure. Um, but those those disclosures are will be related. To, you know, they'll be done by loan type, by past due classification, uh, by the nature of the modification, uh, some other elements in there. Without there's going through the the, the whole list. But at the end of the day. There's quantitative and qualitative disclosures that are required that 
are different than what it have been. Some are the same, but some are different. And there'll be a need to, you know, capture that data. And so that's probably, it's, it's following the rules. But once you follow the rules and say, hey, there's a modification that's in scope, it's capturing the data and getting it into your note disclosure. And that's also presumably what would be reported in your call report mm -hmm. at some level. Having not seen the call report instructions, I'm not exactly sure what the requirements would be, but I think there would be some reporting requirements there. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Capturing that data and making sure that um, it's complete and accurate is, is definitely going to be a, a concern. Now, the, the, the good news is, is that the update can be, can be adopted prospectively. So you can start doing this on a prospective basis as of 1-1. And really what I don't think I said earlier is this, this standard was issued in, in March of 2022, but it, it became effective 1-1 of this year, essentially. There, there, you could have early adopted, but for most folks, 1-1 right. of this year. And so, um, but you can do it prospectively. You don't have to go back. And in the first year, you don't have to do comparatives. So if you're a bank and you've got you've got modifications in this in this reporting period that you're going to need to disclose, you don't have to go back and try to reinvent the wheel for, for last year. You also don't have to continue any TDR disclosures that you had. The ones that were in your report last year, those go away um, for last year. Now, if those if those loans are modified in this period and they need to be disclosed and they'll need to be disclosed. But. TDR accounting is gone as well as the disclosures prospectively. So it sounds like community banks have some work to do as we enter a possible recessionary period. Is that it? Well, unfortunately, no, that's not it. That's just the disclosure piece. So if, if you have, if you have modifications within the scope of the standard, then this is all about this has been all about this discussion has been all about disclosure. Mm -hmm. There's also the element of whether or not the modification uh, meets the criteria to be considered a new loan. Right. And that has no bearing on the disclosure. If the disclosure is required, it's required. If it's not, it's not. But the accounting for the loan might be different depending on whether it's a new loan or not. So a modification results in a new loan. If the new terms are at least as favorable to the institution as comparable loans to other customers with similar risk profiles. So that's, that's the primary consideration. And, and from that, there's really two prongs, if you will. The new loan's effective yield is at least equal to the effective yield of the original loan. Again, these would qualify as new loans. Yes. Or the modifications to the original loan are considered more than minor. So if they're more than minor, then you've got a new loan. But here's the two tests. If the present value of the cash flows of the new versus the old loan is 10% different, the modification is considered more than minor. So you got to do a 10, there's a 10% test. And then if, if you do that test and it's not 10%, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a new loan. That just, you, there are other qualities qualitative considerations that you can make to further evaluate and make sure. And that would, again, that's whether or not it's a new loan impacts the accounting. It actually mm -hmm. doesn't impact whether or not you need to make the disclosure. Okay. So given everything we've discussed today, what final thoughts would you like to leave our listeners? Well, I think the it's really about people in process. So mm -hmm. I think you, you need to make sure that, that, You've identified all the people that need to be trained and you know educated on the subject matter. Make sure they understand that that you know what a modification is, what the at least be able to identify if a loan is meeting one of the four criteria. Make sure they understand what financial difficulty means. They may not be doing a test, if you will, but um, you know basically train everybody up that needs to be aware. So if there's a modification in it that might need to be evaluated further, somebody raises their hand, uh, that the process would also include the systems. So are you capturing the data that you need to uh, in the event you have a modification and you've got to make these evaluations? Are you capturing the data that you need to to, or to make these modifications, You know, particularly the quantitative ones? And, um, and, and on a go forward basis, then, 
you know, what that looks like, I think from process perspective is maybe a checklist or something Mm -hmm. like that, where the people that touch these loans, the people that would be involved in the modification can document some of these things and move it along to in the process so that it could be recognized, you know, in the organization. I think depending on the size of the institution and the number and materiality of modifications, uh, you know, the larger the institution, the more formal the process probably needs right. to be. Right. The, the larger the institution, uh, the, you know, the more, um, the more people involved. So the more structure that you need around it, the smaller, they probably know each other, but they may be sitting across from each other. And so it's a little bit easier to communicate and say, Hey, I've got, I, we're, we're making a modification here, you know, let's, you know, and raise your hand. So I think it just depends on the institution, but people do need to recognize that there is a new standard, that it is different than what's in the past. There are similarities, but you want to make sure that when that time comes that you comply so that your call reporting is accurate as well as the financial reporting for when, when your auditors come in, because they're not, they're not going to be able to go through or not going to want to go through and identify your loan modifications for you. That's some process you need to have in place for the footnote disclosure and any accounting implications. If it in fact is a new, is considered a new law. That was very informative and helpful for our community banks. Thanks for your time today, Doug. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks for listening to this week's It Figures podcast. Please follow CRI on all of our socials. If you have any questions or concerns, please visit CRICPA.com and we will be glad to help. If you want more CRI insights or are interested in learning about our firm, please visit our website at CRICPA.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of It Figures, the CRI podcast. You can subscribe to It Figures on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcasts. If you liked what you heard today, please leave us a review.